esto la familia era bastantito, tenía como ocho hijos. Uno murieron aquí y otros murieron por allá abajo, porque la señora la mataron allá por Pinado Santo, Chavarri. Uh -huh. sí. Él aquí lo capturaron y lo asesinaron. Y el niño lo degollaron, le amparon el cuchillo aquí. Y a Jacobo lo mataron allá en aquel cerco, a balazos, le quebraron la cabeza y... y... Todo lo que había pues lo, lo pedacearon, trastes de losa china que decíamos de una losa fina que hay. Después de matar a nuestra familia, terminaron con todo lo que teníamos. De dejar solamente la casa que no le podían poner juego. Fue todo lo que se salvó. Y estos son los únicos recuerdos que han quedado. Por parte de la Fuerza Armada hicieron y hicieron con mi familia. Y eso es, solo a mí no me tocaron. Porque me fui. In 1981, there was a military operation on the north of the province of Morazan. Uh, that was a guerrilla strong call, and the militaries wanted to move them away from there. So after a few encounters, the guerrilla left the area together with a lot of civilians, and the army entered into the hamlet of El Mozote, where a lot of the population have actually gathered. They separated women, children, and men in, diff in three different groups. They reportedly killed all of them, burn their houses, burn their crops, kill their animals, and repeat exactly the same procedures on five nearby hamlets. The total of the massacred victims is between 800 and 1,000 people. And unlike other massacres, this one was documented at the time by the international press, by the New York Times and the Washington Post, which also published photographs of the remains of the victims at the time, a few weeks after the massacre. But the Salvadoran government and the US government, who was strongly involved supporting the Salvadoran government during the civil war, both denied the existence of the massacre and that there was any evidence to support it. And the massacre was not investigated until almost the end of the war. In 1981, we were called by the legal office of the Catholic Church in El Salvador, Tutela Legal, to work on the forensic side of the investigation of the massacre of El Mozote. The preliminary investigation was particularly long because the people were buried in many different mass graves all along these valleys and hills. So one of the first things that we did was walk with the witnesses through all of this area and trying to map and locate each of these graves and establish, according to them, who was buried there. Hilaria Hernández, Catalina Chica y varios niños. Él dice que usted en este hoyo sepultó a estas personas. ¿Nos podría decir si este hoyo lo excavaron ustedes o ya estaba hecho? No, ya estaba hecho. The goals of EAAF are first to apply forensic sciences into the investigation of human rights cases. Second, to bring all this evidence into court so that physical evidence will accompany testimony and documentary evidence as well. We also want to assist the families of the victims on their right to recover the remains of their loved ones so that they can carry out the customary funeral rites and mourn their death. Training is very important also for us, so we gave training on forensic sciences, on criminal investigations, not only to forensic experts, but also to judges, lawyers, and human rights organizations involved in the process of investigating human rights cases. Finally, we hope to provide evidence that will serve for the historical reconstruction of these events so that uh, governments or parties involved in them that often wants to distort them or hide them can no longer do that.
Iria was formed in 1984 when democracy returned to Argentina and we needed to incorporate the methods from traditional physical anthropology and archaeology to recover the remains of the people that have disappeared during the previous military government. Miente, miente. Hace dos años que estamos así. Desde mi hija estaba embarazada de cinco meses cuando se la llevaron. Mi nieto tiene que haber nacido en agosto del año pasado. Hasta ahora no he podido saber nada de él. Nosotros solamente queremos saber dónde están nuestros hijos, vivos o muertos. Se comenzaron a realizar investigaciones, intentando saber qué había pasado con los cuerpos de esas personas y uno de los destinos que habían sufrido es que habían sido enterrados sin identificación como él en el cementerio de todo el país. There was no experience in Argentina, as well as in many other countries, of having to deal with massive number of exhumations of skeletal remains, which is a different thing than when you're exhuming a complete body. It's a very quite simple procedure in which you just lift the body and take it back to the laboratory. But those first exhumations were done in a very unmethodological way, using bulldozers or keepers from the cemetery to recover the remains. When you're exhuming skeletal remains, you have more than 200 bones to pick up from the grave and associated evidence such as ballistic evidence and so on that could be quite important in terms of uh, determining the cause of death. And for that, you need to recover it in a different way. And that's when archaeology comes in. In Argentina, we have this problem that is quite common in Latin America and in other places, which is that the forensic people often are part of the police or the judiciary. So when you're analyzing cases in which the police or the judiciary system is questioned by its actions during the time in which they should have investigated this properly, there is a conflict of interest there. This is why a new alternative, a new group of people needed to be involved to work on these kind of cases. As democracy was moving around the region, we work almost in all Latin American countries. We also started working in Africa a few years ago, and we work there in, in six or seven countries by now, in some countries in, in Asia and a few countries in uh, Eastern Europe, mostly on the Balkan region. The work that we do is normally divided into three different steps. The preliminary investigation, the archaeological section, and the laboratory work. In 1981, we were not allowed to work in El Mosotti. We were told by the judge and by the Supreme Court that we needed to wait until the civil war was over. Finally, in 92, we did one site there that was part of the United Nations Truth Commission report that came on March 93. Immediately after that, there was an amnesty law that would stop all kind of investigation, including exhumations. It was only seven years later, in the year 2000, when we were allowed to come back to continue with the exhumations in El Mosote so that the families could recover the remains of their loved ones. Puede decirnos más o menos la edad de Catalina Chica? Bueno, la edad de Catalina Chica aproximadamente estaría como unos 7 años de la pues. Sí, como la edad. ¿Y de María Justa Rufina Guevara cuántos años le daría a usted? Mira, aproximadamente estaría como 50 años de la pues. ¿Y usted cree que vamos a encontrar las cabecitas acá y los pies allá? ¿Pueden sí, buscar eh. eso? ¿Qué profundidad tenía el puesto? No sé sí, el puesto no tenía como... ¿Dos metros? Dos metros. Ah, muchas gracias, señora. Sí, 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 sí. Están ahí, mucho. Sí, sí. Y acá hay dos familiares suyos, Josefina sí. Hernández sí. e Hilaria Hernández. Josefina era su esposa. Sí, sí. Acá hubo dos o tres cuerpos que encontró también arriba. Ahí había dos, la niña con, con la señora Matea, ¿va? Uh -huh. Y Conce con su nieto y ella con el piernito aquí. Sí, allá ¿Cuántas? estaba la otra hermana mía. ¿Cuántas personas están acá? Aquí hay nueve. 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 Después de poner todos los cuerpos, ¿cuánta tierra le, le habrán sobre los cuerpos? Sí. Mm, fue poca. Poca. Fue esta, poca. Sí. sí. Es que lo que jalábamos era ceniza para perrar, para no ver a aquello. 
Y uh -huh. este anillito de, de piedras también se lo hicieron ustedes sí, en esa mejor. época, sí, en ese momento. Sí, para detener la, la tierra. Y esto está exactamente en el mismo lugar que ustedes lo pusieron en el 81. Sí, ahí está, sí. The way in which the massacre happened at the beginning of the war, the people will tell us what they never thought women and children would be touched. So when they knew the military operation was coming, the men left the area because they thought the army was going to go after them. So during the night, when the army withdrew to their base, the men will come out of the places where they were hiding and they will bury their families wherever they find them. So here we are interviewing mostly husbands that have lost their entire families. The victims of the massacre are mostly women, older people or children. And the number of victims per family was something that was completely incredible. When we were interviewing the relatives of the victims, um, we reached the point at which we will ask them how many members of your family you lost. And coming from Argentina, the answer will normally be one or two. Here people were telling us 10, 12, 16 members of my family. And I remember asking them, no, wait, I mean direct members of your family. And they will repeat 10, 12, 16. My wife, my six children, my sister, her children, my father, my mother, and so on. This was completely new for us, and we were completely shocked by it. Cuando empecé a trabajar más en la parte de testimonios, a hacer toda la parte de investigación preliminar, ahí sí ya era como que los huesos con los que yo estaba trabajando en la parte arqueológica habían sido asesinados, esas personas eh, me estaban contando una historia terrible y, y eso me afectó muchísimo. Tampoco es que no sienta la muerte trabajando en esto. Durante el trabajo no, durante el trabajo en arqueología, durante el trabajo en la investigación preliminar, no, no, los, no siento esa angustia. Ahora cuando hacemos una identificación y devolvemos los restos y con, acompañamos a los familiares en el duelo, ahí lloro y, y creo que todo el mundo llora del equipo porque, y creo que es sano, porque, porque como que descargamos este, toda esa tensión que significó haber trabajado en eso. el contacto con los familiares pero también me gusta estar en, en el campo trabajando con ellos eh, cuando estamos haciendo, haciendo las entrevistas o buscando una fosa o el trabajo diario de estar excavando este, sean cosas muy lindas muy, muy fuerte, un contexto muy fuerte ¿Me está ya acabo? ¿Me está ya acabo? Talantinam and that a yak now. A henagar head or Tamarmoro, Labet has have eh? Yemimata Lena Tamaluso, Babet at Bonda Cabaraso, no decem Milan. Hedo Tamarmoro Simalazelen, Tamaluso Slam of Islam, Christian of Christian Sikabrena, the Jocho and Dagan nomen Nile. Eh? A him the Moimat Alvalan, but has fine nomen the Tababan. Does he know that he that may take some time? Certainly, I know, and will be patient. EAF always work at the request of an organization. It could be a local human rights organization or an international one, such as Amnesty International Human Rights Watch. It could be a local uh, judiciary who will call us to work, or an international tribunal, such as ICTY in La Hague. Permission to do exhumations from a legal standpoint in most of the countries where we work, it is uh, strictly a condition set by a judge, or sometimes by a truth commission that has that capacity. Now, EAF also has this rule that it's it's not to do with the law, but it has to do with our principle in which if the families don't want us to intervene, we just don't work on those cases. At the start of the investigation, we conduct extensive interviews with the families in which, among other things, we explain them the different steps of the work that we do. But we go over that again when we're actually about to start the exhumation. 
está bien, bueno, perfecto. Sí. Que la excavación de esta fosa va a llevar varios días, porque hay varias personas ahí sí. y tenemos que ir documentando cada paso que hacemos, tomando mediciones y demás, sí. para que vaya todo en el informe del juez. Después de eso, tenemos que llevar todos los restos, incluidos los que encontremos aquí, Ajá. para Santa Tecla, medicina legal allí. Así ahí podemos ver cómo eh, los huesitos, si hay marcas de cómo murieron, para que quede asentado eso. Eh, y también para tratar de separar cada uno de los cuerpos de, de ellos, para que podamos entregarle a cada uno de ustedes su familiar. Sí. Los restos siempre van a estar bajo custodia sí. del juez. Sí. Y cuando pasa de custodia del juez, pasa a custodia de medicina legal. O sea, nunca van a estar sueltos. Y van a estar siempre cerrados y presentados. Solo nosotros los podemos eh, abrir. Así que en ese sentido, para que se queden tranquilos, que no va a haber, que no van a estar perdidos por ahí. Este, pues, si no se encuentran los niños, están los calabres que son mayores de edad de los niños, ¿cómo se puede hacer ahí? Este, ¿Sabe que Los calabres los vamos a encontrar. Sí casi seguro, sí, si están sí. allí tienen que estar todavía ah, allí, sí. Sí, sí. porque a veces los huesitos pueden no estar tan bien, pero están, digamos. Sí, sí, sí. Lo que por ahí no podemos hacer, vio, supóngase que hay cinco niñitos, sí. y tres son de una familia y dos son de otra, sí. y de repente algunos de los niños de cada familia tienen las mismas edades, sí. y son, por ejemplo, dos hembritas de cinco años cada una, sí. o sea, la, los dos cuerpitos van a estar, los dos esqueletitos van a estar, sí. Pero por ahí no le podemos decir exactamente cuál, qué hembrita pertenece a una familia sí. y cuál pertenece a la otra. Ah, sí, sí. Pero, pero si están allí, tienen que estar todavía los huesitos sí, allí. We're treating a grave as if it is a crime scene. So everything that is there can eventually or potentially be something that can help you to understand what happened and how it happened. So that's why you have to work very, very slowly in order to find everything that is there. Don't move it. Record it. Measure each of the findings. On an adult skeleton, there's 206 bones and 32 teeth, and you don't want to miss any of them. You have to recover them properly. Often, in, in these cases, the skull has been fractured, normally by a gunshot wound to the head, so there's many pieces of skull that you have to recover to reconstruct it later in the laboratory. The two sometimes fall out of the socket and they are around. There might be bullets also around that you need to recover. It. So we also use metal detectors. We also screen all the soil that is immediately above at the same level and underneath the main bank of evidence. In the case of a mosote, for example, of the convent, a very small room where we found 140 bodies, uh, mostly skeletons of, of children. What the witness was saying were the bodies were left there, then the house was set on fire, and the first thing that collapsed was the roof over the bodies. And then a few days after, because the smell was too strong, the soldiers that were still in the place dumped part of the adobe walls above the remains of the roof. And that's exactly how we find it. <laughs> Que al parecer puede corresponder a un niño aproximadamente de unos 3 o 4 años. Se ha encontrado tibia y el peroné. Él se encuentra también a resto ya quemado de la otra botita que podría corresponder a la siguiente miembro inferior, podría ser el, el derecho este y el izquierdo acá la parte acá de la de la pelvis, si aquí podríamos observar, podría ser ya lo que corresponde a la parte torácica y el cráneo que se observa con fracturas cuando los skeletons start uncovering them, the first thing is you give a code, you give a number to that skeleton, that will remain with that skeleton until you can put a name to it, until you can identify basically those remains. And you take a number of measurements so that you have it located properly within the, the working area. You look at the clothing, you try to see if there's something inside pockets or something like that so that you won't miss it. That, For example, sometimes you may find 
personal effects that can be very important to identify the person, or coins that are very important to date an event. Primero se ve el parte del tórax el 68. Por debajo aparece miembros inferiores del 85. Y por debajo del 85, este es, este es el fémur del 85, por debajo del 85, el cráneo del 87. Y al costado del cráneo del 87, tibia y peroné del número 57, 57 que a su vez apoyaban y iban en aquella dirección. Encontramos eh, huesitos diminutos dentro de la cavidad pelviana de este esqueleto. Se numeró con el número esqueleto 81 y corresponderían a un niño recién nacido, recién recién nacido o a un feto. Cuando se me presentó la oportunidad de hacer este trabajo, eh, no lo descarté, pero indudablemente sí que se me presentó esa duda y el miedo, el miedo de decir, bueno, lo hago y después qué pasa, qué pasa en este país, qué pasa conmigo. Eh, ¿Estoy preparada para hacerlo? No sé, ¿qué pasaría si levanto un esqueleto de un humano? No tengo familiares desaparecidos, no tengo amigos directos desaparecidos, sí conozco gente. Pero también me costó porque los primeros años, cuando trabajaba, estaba tan inmersa en el trabajo que la persona a la cual estábamos exhumando resultaba ya como un amigo mío. Y entonces eso me ocasionado muchos problemas internos porque cuando nosotros se producía la restitución yo sentía realmente mucha amargura como si fuera un familiar mío ya te, había tenido muchas pérdidas mi mamá, mi papá y, y no encontraba la diferencia entre las pérdidas de mis padres con la pérdida de estas personas a las cuales yo jamás había conocido I think that the work is important for the families of the victims because when someone disappeared from your family What the families always tell us is they cannot rest until they find the remains of their loved ones. First of all, they don't know if that person is dead or alive. And even though most families, of course, know that as the years go by and they have no information, that most likely they are dead. But they cannot decide this by themselves. They need to either have the remains and rebury them properly and have a grave where they can go, or they have to have some kind of official acknowledgement and information about what happened. So they cannot rest until they have one of the two things. And that's why when we're able to identify the remains of one disappeared person, for us it's a major event. At the laboratory, there's basically two things we try to establish. One is the cause and manner of death, and the other one, we try to identify the remains. Through the bones, you can determine the age of the individual when the person died, the sex, the ancestry, the laterality, if it was a woman, if it had given birth or not, sometimes the cause of death, if it had affected the bones. Sometimes you can eventually see if the person had been under custody and you see fractures that are in the process of healing. You may sometimes predict that that person had been bitten while still alive, but close to the moment of death. What you have here is a child. I, I'm putting, and I'm also saying it's a she because these, these teeth are on the small side and the chin. 
is more rounded. So it's probably around five years old, plus or minus 16 months. I don't know what the posterior part of her skull is, but there is a little bit of fire damage up here, so it may have been just completely destroyed by fire. Gladstone went to Argentina in 1984 at the request of the Truth Commission there and some local human rights organizations to help on the process of exhuming and analyzing human skeletal remains. Clyde trained us on these disciplines of forensic anthropology and forensic archaeology and helped to form our team as well as other teams that later develop in other countries might be worth x-raying, although I kind of think it's far from I oh, can't be really sure. It may not be. So why don't we take a look at that, too? Podría ser un fragmento de núcleo de proyectil. ¿Cómo lo vieron? Porque en la biografía se ve la densidad metálica. Dos fragmentos metálicos. We reconstruct, for example, the bones that has what we call perimodern fractures, that is to say fractures that occurred around the moment of death. Uh, in the case of gunshot wounds, this will help us to locate the entrances and the exits of a shot. And that is sometimes very important in terms of manner of death. Cause of death is what caused the person to die, for example, that the person had been shot. But the manner is how that happened. Was this an accident, a suicide, or was this a homicide? By locating the entrance of a gunshot wound, sometimes that can provide us information in terms of manner of death. If the entrance of a gunshot wound, it's on the back of the head, that it's very unlikely to be an accident or suicide. It's much more likely that that is a homicide. Y lo que se observa en la región del occipital es una herida de, de entrada de proyectil de arma de fuego con bisel a expensas de la tabla interna, del cual salen dos trazos fracturarios. Este impacto es posiblemente esté relacionado con una trayectoria de atrás hacia adelante con una pequeña inclinación estamos hablando de que la posible salida de ese disparo corresponde a la zona de la órbita One major challenge for the next years is to improve the amount of identification in most countries in which uh, these massive human rights problems occurred most bodies are still not identified, and for that we need to improve access to DNA analysis. DNA have made an enormous revolution in our field, allowing us to have many more identifications. However, it's still very expensive. When DNA needs to be extracted from bones, from skeletal remains, it is a complex process, more complex than when it's done directly on soft tissue, and not all the laboratories will do it. So basically we're still relying now on the help of some very nice laboratories that donate their work to do this. But they can of course accommodate only a very limited amount of cases. So a major technical thing would be using new technology that for example it's been developed now to identify the victims of the World Trade Center. And we're hoping that all those new tools are going to be transported into the human rights field. So let's taste them. Después de 18 años de estar trabajando en este campo, que por un lado es bastante terrible, porque por otro lado nos da la posibilidad, y lo que me pasa a mí me da la posibilidad de aportar un poco de, de alivio a, a la familia, tratar de buscar un poco la verdad, que, eh, aportar pleos a la justicia, que además nos hagan eh, participar en un proceso de justicia y de saber quiénes fueron los responsables de esto. Unfortunately, in human rights in general, there are very few cases in which the perpetrators are brought to trial, and so that our evidence accompany the witness testimonies will, will be used. In Argentina, it was used on the trials against the junta members. 
that happened in 1985. When we were part of the teams working in the Balkans from the International War Crime Tribunal of former Yugoslavia, that evidence has been currently used. And more recently, now evidence has been used in the trials against the Derge regime members in Ethiopia. Mr. Clyde Collins, no, you have been called upon to act as a witness in uh, the proceedings against the three first juntas of the so-called Proceso de Reorganización Nacional as a witness for the prosecution. The uh, bones of the skull, as we found them, were <clears throat> very fragmented form. Along with the fragments, we also found seven pellets from a shotgun, badly deformed, but of a size consistent with the load of double off buckshot used in shotguns such as the Itaka, which is used as a standard police and army security weapon in Argentina. Because of the very fragmentary condition of the skull, we had to reconstruct it in order to study the patterns of injuries. We concluded that the range at which this shot was fired was in the general range of around one meter or perhaps a little less than a meter. When we exhumed the skeleton, we did not encounter the small bones of a human infant inside the pelvic bones of the mother. On the other hand, we did see in the pelvis bones a groove known as the preauricular sulcus, which indicates that the individual has given birth to a term or near-term infant. Putting all this information together, we were able to identify the individual as Liliana Carmen Correa, who disappeared on her way home from work on the 5th of October in 1977. Some families want to see the remains, and we always are open to that. And if they want us to explain them also, how we identify that person, why we decide that those remains correspond to that person, we also do that. It's not an easy moment for them, not easy for us to. Because you see them suffering, you see how they have this completely mixed feelings about in one way. Finally, they have an answer. But the answer is that their relative is dead, obviously. And that is the end of finding him or her alive. And what is what you're actually showing them? You're showing them the skeletal remains of their relative, where often the skull is fractured and broken, other bones as well. You're showing them bullets, pieces of clothing, of personal effects. If any of us can imagine seeing your father, your mother, your child skeleton in that way, I think that's one of the most difficult and impossible things to watch and to understand.
Yo te van los hitos. ¿Querés que vos los huesos? Después que nosotros estudiemos y que los huesos vengan para acá y cada uno esté en su cajita y esté identificado, esta es de cada uno de, su, de los familiares si quieren hacer un velatorio individual, colectivo, si quieren enterrar en un cementerio todos juntos. Sí. Eso es una cosa que no tiene nada que ver con nosotros. Eso lo tienen que hablar la familia junta y ponerse de acuerdo y no ponerse. Pero es una decisión que es suya. No tiene nada que ver el juez ni nosotras en el juez. Chicas que tienen varios familiares The consequences of the work of El Mosote were, first of all, that the families were able to recover the remains of the loved ones and so they reburied them. The second main consequence was that this was an extremely controversial case. For years there was this big battle, basically, on one side the Salvadoran government and the U.S. government saying that this was a shura, that there was no evidence of a massacre, and then the families of the victims and witnesses saying this was a massacre. These people were just killed, eliminated by the Salvadoran army. The evidence that we find in this case and the location of the evidence was crucial, uh, indicating that this was a massacre. Not only we found 141 individuals, from which the majority were children, uh, all covered with bullets, with approximately 250 fragments of bullets, but also we found an equal number of cartridge cases on the other side of the room. We found fragments of bullets in holes inside of the floor and a number of other details and elements of evidence that all put together strongly indicated that this was a massacre and that there was no evidence indicating that this, uh, the possibility of a combat. The remains that we exhumed in 92, as well as the ones we exhumed in the year 2000 and 2001, are most of them put on a monument that the community have built in the hamlet of El Mosote. And they have dug up a big grave in which they keep on putting the coffins with the remains as we are exhuming them year by year. It was a particularly moving ceremony on December 2001 when we went because not only the remains were reburied, but also there was a sense of history and a sense of 20 years of how long it takes and how many things need to be done sometimes to uncover the truth, to bring part of that truth back to the people that actually have suffered from what happened and that have witnessed this. When you pass and you live through a dictatorship, you need to repair it in a way, a lot of things that have been completely broken. And uh, even if you are not directly affected. I think that uncovering the truth and bringing that truth to the public knowledge is really important, uh, not only for the families of the victims, but also for each member of our society that have experienced this. It brings solace, I think, to, to all of us. And I think that all the members of the team feel that very strong. And that's what sort of kept us together all these years and uh, make us also to go to another country to do exactly the same work. Mm -hmm.